So we're going to continue our teachings on the six perfections, the six paramitas. And I think a good place to start is why do we suffer? Do we got an answer for that? Worry. Worry. Worry is a lot of stuff. What's that? Our values are in the line. Yeah. We do a lot of things that are undermining our values, right? We do a lot of things that we don't feel good about. Untamed minds. Yeah, so being pulled place to place. Were you the one who said worry or was that? Okay. I looked at you. All right. Um, so we have untrained minds and we get hooked. And uh, a lot of times we act out of autopilot. So, heck, I don't even know what my values are when I'm reacting. Anything else coming up? And those of you online, feel free to participate as well. Right. What's arising to us as real, right? Deceptively appearing phenomena as real. Yeah. That's been the topic of a little Tuesday morning thing we've been working with. So I'm starting here because, you know, this is really what all of Buddhism is about, how to not suffer. So it's helpful to know why we suffer. And, and then we have a context for engaging in practices that alleviate suffering. And if I'm clear about the cause of my suffering, that's going to help me be a lot more clear about how to remedy that. And yet, um, we can be, as human beings, so often in our attempts to avoid suffering, creating suffering. Right? And um, it's not very helpful. So the Buddha gave these teachings. He gave these teachings on the Noble Eightfold Path which is the path to alleviate suffering. And we, we studied that. We went through that path. And in the Theravadan tradition, that path is, is, uh, is the context with which we, we went through it. And now we've kicked up to the Bodhisattva path. The Bodhisattva path is, is how do we incorporate that with the view of the Bodhisattva that says, not only am I suffering, but everybody's suffering. <sighs> We're all in this together. And I recognize that my whole way of being is interdependent with yours and with, with all life. And, uh, and it begs a bigger question. You know, how do I really end suffering? And the question that was asked a little bit later, not how do I become free of suffering, but now we ask a bigger question. How do I become a Buddha? How do I become completely free and helpful to all others be free? And that's where this six perfections comes in, the Bodhisattva path. And you're going to find that these same, um, same path components will be arising just in a little different context. So today, we, if I ever get to it, will be <laughs> uh, what we'll call joyous effort. But in the Eightfold Path, it's right effort. And so this, this path of awakening really starts with right view, which is start to understand that. Reading right into that. Right view is to understand the nature of cause and effect, the nature of how things are, just how they are, more accurately. And to understand right view, I understand that there's cause and effect. I don't suffer for no reason. I, I, there's causes for suffering. And there's some real you know, things that I couldn't avoid. You know, uh, 
difficulties I had in childhood, events where I've been bullied or things of that nature, harmful things, found tragic things can happen. Those, those are going to create suffering. And through my desire, through my misperception, as, as was pointed out, a misperception of these events, I am going to create uh, and shape my view of the world through a particular lens. And we all do this, it's just human. I'm going to experience this room a little bit different than you do. You're going to experience it through your cultural background, through your upbringing, through the experiences you had, through um, just the conditioning. And through that conditioning, I'm going to find there's people I like, people I don't like. There's events I enjoy more than others. There's people that annoy me. And uh, there are people that I really want to hang out with. And some people actually like this cold weather. There's some people sitting in Florida saying, you can have it. No way. There's other people, man, can't wait for that ski. <laughs> people can't wait to get away from there. And so what happens to our conditioning is this world we experience, we see a very objective world out there, which is what was brought up. I perceive it to be real. I perceive how I'm seeing the world as the way it is. And, and then I'm going to negotiate how I interact with it to give me as much pleasure as possible, which happens to be the source of all my stuff. <laughs> uh, therein lies the problem. I can't fix all this to make me happy. And, uh, and that's what I'll try to do. It's a misperception. In that process, I'm going to misidentify who John is. I'm going to misidentify who you are. And I'm going to attach qualities. And I'm going to exaggerate your qualities. Good, bad, friendly, not friendly. You know, how wonderful things are. How delicious this Australian black chocolate uh, licorice is. It's not delicious but I'm having a delicious experience as uh, I get to chew on it. And so through this uh, conditioning, why wouldn't we, you know, well, that, that is delicious. And then I want more. And I really don't want you to have any of it. And if you try to take it, I'm gonna be pretty frustrated about that. And now I've got me and mine, you and yours. I got the things that make me happy. And then not so happy when they're gone. Or when I don't have them. Or if I do get them, then I really want to save them. Or I want to get more of them. And then my mind, this misunderstanding of grasping to things, I am placing all of my happiness, my efforts, my energy into trying to collect as many pleasurable experiences as possible and to try to avoid unpleasant ones as much as possible. And now, you know, I'm going to spend the whole of my life creating suffering for my life because there's no one thing, event, person, or anything out there that can provide me that lasting happiness I seek. And you guys just don't cooperate and won't act the way I would like you to most of the time. And so me and mine, you and yours. And so I bring this up because it's with this understanding that we engage in a bodhisattva path to understand this interdependence that, in fact, everything I have in my life is because of all of you and countless others. And you know, the people that created language so I can read. There's a piece of paper here. You know how many people were involved in this piece of paper? You know, there's no way to comprehend. Just first off, the paper and the wood and the seed and the nutrients became a tree. And someone figured out how to make paper out of a tree. And, you know, and then there was machinery and it was refined for many years. And then, you know, at some point, this particular tree got cut down and all the lives that took place for that tree to happen and live cut down and I better speed up because I know it's going to be a few years if I go through every step but but that's just paper 
And then how did that paper get here in my printer to print? Let alone the words on the paper. And this happens to be part of the, the Bodhisattva path and the teaching by Venerable Tukin children. And there's a lineage of yogis that pass down and train in these teachings. And for all these teachings to come down through the years and then to be translated into English and it to be taught, I think, in 2004, and how many times it was taught. And then someone transcribed it. And, you know, basically, I have a piece of paper with some words here. And millions and millions of beings are involved for me to have a piece of paper with the Dharma and the Path of Awakening right here on the table. I can forget all that. I think that's a paper and that is me. I can forget all that. Everything I say, everything I perceive, uh, any joy I've ever had is dependent upon all of these causes and conditions and myriads of others. And so how can I be so separate from you? And how can I be self-concerned self about my happiness? Not so much about yours. This is the mind that goes into the Bodhisattva path, this understanding of our interdependence. The understanding that we're in this together and everything we have in our lives is due to countless others and the path of awakening the teachings that lead to no more suffering are because of all of us. And there's no way I can achieve enlightenment without you. Right? There's no way. I couldn't know compassion. I couldn't know suffering. I couldn't know how to engage and cultivate these qualities. If you didn't irritate me enough, I wouldn't know how to develop patience. If you didn't share your joy and kindness with me, I wouldn't know how to, to love and care. Uh, if you didn't react when I said something inappropriate, I wouldn't know it's inappropriate. If you didn't smile when I said something kind and thoughtful, I wouldn't know how kind and thoughtful. There's a reflective experience that I get through just even how I interact with others, let alone food, clothing, shelter, etc. And so much of our sufferings wrapped around intending to me and mine, which causes you and yours. And then uh, me believing that my experience is very separate and not uh, a result of what I'm bringing to the moments, not just the moments that exist. So this right uh, view incorporates the the way that I create pleasurable experiences is through how I live my life. It's not the experiences. How do I condition myself to have a pleasant experience when I have licorice? There's actually some people who don't like black licorice. Odd. Some people don't like it. Some people do. The difference is the conditions that create the experience have a pleasurable experience and that's going to be karmically related. So the wholesome activities I've, I've engaged in, the, the activities that have been beneficial that come from um, goodwill, from harmlessness, from an understanding of our connection, those types of activities, and we, we talked about that with our ethics, are going to create the conditions that give rise to pleasurable experiences. So for me to have a pleasurable experience now is dependent upon things I've done previously and how I've conditioned myself, created those seeds. So right view is very important because if I don't understand that, uh, I miss the path of awakening, I miss the path of no more suffering, that I am planting the seeds of anger or of goodwill now by how I interact. I'm reaffirming frustration and insecurity or I'm reaffirming a sense of connectedness. 
loving kindness now. And if I don't plant those seeds, they don't grow. So these rules around karma, one of them is very simple. No cause, no result. Right? No cause, no result. It's interesting. Uh, when I first learned that, there's these five, four rules, four rules. Run back in my memory banks, four. Uh, first one is, if there is a cause, there's a result. It's the way that is. That makes sense. Do something, there's going to be a result. No cause, no result. That struck me as funny at first. No cause, no result. No big deal. Except for, I would like the result of being happy. <laughs> I don't create the cause, not going to happen. I would like to have the result of, you know, wholeness, to be well, to, you know, I'd like to create the cause of wisdom, of awakening. Well, I mean, the result of that, no cause, no result. So if I'm not planting those seeds, I'm not going to get that result. And right? if I want an orange tree, planting apple seeds is not going not to help. I can have the soil and all that, the nutrients. No, no apple seed, no orange seed, no orange tree. So right view is so important to understand cause and effect and the cause of the conditions that give rise to well-being, pleasure, a sense of wellness, wholeness, uh, the conditions to see more clearly, to see more accurately, to eliminate mental afflictions. And so within this, again, Theravada, uh, right, we got right view, and then we have this right intention. It's the intention that's going to have the big impact on what seeds I'm planting. It's the intention. So if I want to be happier, if I want to hear peace, I want well-being, I want to cultivate and have more pleasurable experiences in my life, I don't want to suffer, I want to have some equanimity and some well-being. Well, it's it's you know just three things I need to remember, which is easy because you know I don't like those lists that are like nine and then three sub points and then this. Uh, but but three things, you know, what's my motivation? Is it ill will or is it goodwill? Am I coming from a place of goodwill, wishing the best for you, wishing the best for myself, understanding our connection? Uh, is it <clears throat> harmlessness or is it uh, harmfulness? Is it compassion? So the three things fundamentally are, am I coming from a place of loving kindness? Am I coming from a place of compassion? The, the third one, I'm hesitating, it's renunciation. So renunciation, we say that word in so many times it gets... Um, put into a sense of someone uh, in a very uh, sparse lifestyle. A renunciation is just renouncing the delusion of my separateness. You know, I'm, I'm renouncing the delusion uh, that, you know, those things out there are going to make me happy or not. You know, it's uh, a renunciation of this grasping of samsara. And so if I'm coming from a place of understanding interdependence, I'm coming from a place of loving kindness or compassion, then everything I do is therefore meritorious, spiritually meritorious, that cultivates good karmic imprints. And then those karmic imprints are in my consciousness and my way of being. And then when I have a piece of licorice or I see someone or I have this event or the car breaks down or I have to get stuck in another line or I go to get my tires changed and the line is 30 <laughs> minutes long and they can't get it in today, uh, I might not be frustrated. I might actually be standing there going, wow, I have a car. <laughs> and... Uh, I just had 30 minutes to reflect upon the meaning of life. <laughs> How often do I get that chance? 
or I could be in that line and be miserable. 30 minutes might feel like two hours and then be a raving maniac when I get to the counter. But fundamentally, all I did was stand <laughs> in a building. But how I perceived that building, how I perceived others, I might see that as a lot of people working really hard to make sure people's cars are safe and on the road and uh, working in this cold weather so that we could be safe or as people are not doing what I want. <laughs> and, uh, and then I have to come back another time. And how unfair that is. You know, where's the suffering? It's in the condition I've been creating. So if I start to understand that, what I think, say, and do is really going to lead to how I experience these events in my day, in my life, cause and result. Well, if I want to plant the seeds then, excuse me, if I want to then plant the seeds that lead to well-being, loving kindness, compassion, renunciation. And that means that whatever the event is that's happening, whether it's tragic, irritating, joyful, a little bit fun, somewhat neutral, it doesn't matter. This event is now the time to plant those seeds, whatever it is. Every event in my life is an opportunity to cultivate the path of awakening, of no more suffering, to plant seeds of well-being for how to engage in life, cultivate my highest potentials, see more clearly. So this becomes the cause for me to practice. Now, isn't that nice? I mean, we can just know that everything that happens in your life is an opportunity to cultivate the path of awakening. That's pretty cool. We can do that 24 seven, except that we probably can't, right? <laughs> Therein lies the challenge because I've been conditioned and so I have feelings and so I'm not very helpful with my reactions because my mind's a bit untrained and <sighs> and so how do we start to unravel that and so this is within this path we talked about generosity and we talked about ethics and last week was patience and now we're coming to right effort or joyous effort because that's the thing we need the effort to maintain that ability to put into practice these teachings. And so that requires effort. And this effort is something that will develop over time. You know, I equate it a lot to, uh, I remember I, I, uh, I was a very skinny, poor young man in early recovery you know, from addiction and all that. And I, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't have any money. I lived in a studio apartment. I took the bus to deliver auto parts. And right next door to our auto parts there was this super fancy, uh, full-on spa fitness gym with, you know, like the lockers and they give you hot towels and the, all that stuff. And you have the men's weight room and the men's locker room. And, you know, it was just, really expensive place and uh, and I got a free uh, free thing to go there because I worked at the store next door and they had some little things so I, I had this free deal to go there so I bought one pair of shorts you know and a few pair of gym socks you know because I could fit in and my arms were like these little tweeny things and uh, and I went in there and um, and I felt totally out of place, right? Didn't belong, you know, I don't know, you know, how these people have resources. And, uh, and then uh, in the men's weight room, that's where I was gonna exercise. Uh, you know, it's pretty big guys in there. And, uh, and I would go in there and I remember, <laughs> like I, I literally just, the bar is, you know, the bar is like 45 pounds. 45. Yeah, it's 45 pounds. That's just the bar with any weights on it. Yeah. 
you know, so these guys, had, and uh, I'd put like some little weights on it, and, uh, and it was heavy, and it was hard, and I felt awkward, and I felt less than, you know, but I did it anyway. Did it anyway, show up anyway. And, you know, what happened over time is that uh, something that was awkward, that was hard, and I didn't feel good enough, I did consistently. And uh, pretty soon I was able to walk in there, you know, get my little locker thing and, and, uh, and actually get fairly strong. And, uh, and that was just by uh, effort effort and it was interesting because i noticed during that time that there were some people who would look into the men's weight room you know like they wanted to go in but if they saw some kind of big guys they wouldn't come and they would just go you know and and um, you know there's a sense of a i want to go in there when nobody's looking and uh and i identified with that and i think dorm is a lot like that we don't feel like maybe we can do it right. We don't feel like we can um, have those types of skills. Uh, other people, when we meditate, they all seem like they got it together. You know, especially this guy. Look how he sits. You know, that guy's got nailed, right? And, uh, you know, and everybody looks like they know what you're talking about. And But not me, because if you knew what the heck was going on in here when I'm sitting, man, this hurts. My God, I'm sure, you know, it's, it's a, you know. And... And so it's, it's starting to understand that with, with this right effort is understand that uh, one of the forms of laziness is where I want to talk to is, is in the joyous effort is, is the antidote to these lazinesses. One of them is thinking we can't do it. Three forms of laziness. One's procrastination. I think we can all relate to that eventually when you have time to get to it. Uh, Another one, which I really find fascinating, is uh, busyness. Busyness is a form of laziness. In other words, we're busy doing all the things that aren't as important as the things we need to do, right? We don't even do our practice because I got all these things. I'm way too busy creating stress where you fear in my life to make time to eliminate it. Very busy. So busyness. Uh, but the third one is doubt. The third one is, you know, I just don't feel like I got it. It's for other people. And I don't have it. And that that's why I'm relating that story. Is that I think one of the big uh, difficulties that we have, especially more more so in the West, I think, is uh, it's just not a sense that that we're good enough. You know, that uh, you know we're comparing ourselves a lot. And those other people, you know, they got it. And I remember what that was like going to the Dharma Center in Long Beach. <laughs> how everybody had their stuff together, you know. Just like me going to the gym. I went there anyway. I mean, they had all this very elaborate stuff. I didn't know what any of it was. And, you know, uh, and one day, yeah, just I just didn't know. But, uh, but I would raise my hand and ask a question anyway. And I asked some stupid questions. I mean, well, now I think they're kind of... But I asked them, and uh, there was an effort there. And, and there was just enough pain in my life to be able to do that. And I think that's what gets us here, is enough pain to start making a change, to become willing to put some effort in. But what makes it sustainable or not uh, is how do we put effort in that's going to be sustainable and meaningful? And part of that is to know that you're, you're enough. You have Buddha nature. You have it. You're enough. It's all there. The only thing we're lacking is the consistency in the path. That's, that's really it. Just like going to that thing, I would go there. Side note, I just want to tell the story. It may or not be relevant, but... I used to work out and be a pretty big guy after all that. It kind of became a thing. And then I didn't work out for a long time. I became a school teacher. School teachers don't have time for that. They're too busy. And, uh, and they procrastinate a lot. And so I finally went to a gym, got all excited, got to the gym, you know, and uh, went to the, the, the weight room, the big area. I had a little bit of an ego. 
I put on two of the big plates, you know, because I used to be able to. 45 twice, yeah, a couple of those. Well, first I warmed up with just one, then I put the two on, and this is what happened. <laughs> and I was stuck there, totally humiliated. Uh, and I can't move, and like there's all these people around, but I want them to notice. <laughs> so I'm like, Psst, hey. Anyway, I got some guy to help me out. It was, uh, it was ridiculous. Um, and uh, and I shared that just in the sense that um, there was a time when my ego didn't get in my way. And I was willing to do the work. And there's a time when my ego got in the way. And I couldn't do the work. And I couldn't see what was in front of me. And I suffered. And, uh, and since that time, both in exercise, is I've, I've learned to be gradual about my process. <laughs> Put a, few, a little bit on. Work my way up. Likewise, in my practice, is to understand that for right effort, I am going to make reasonable amounts of practice and effort and study and understand that there's going to be days I'm not going to be that on and there's going to be days where uh, I have a little more to give. Uh, but those are ebbs and flows, waves on the ocean. I'm going to be steady. I'm going to maintain, maintain an effort that is addressing a fundamental belief that this is doable, even if I can't do it today, even if I can't do it right now. I still want to do it. I'm still capable. And instead of being unskillful, it's not yet skillful. And so I think that's really critical as we get into what we call uh, joyous effort. Because if I don't have that attitude, this is not going to be very joyful. <laughs> and if it's not very joyful, it's not very sustainable. And so when I practice meditation, you know, how can I <clears throat> engage in a meditation practice that might be challenging and feel pretty good about it? Well, I think one reason is to know why I'm doing it. And then to have a reminder before I do it, how valuable this is for me and what an opportunity it is to transform my life. And then meditate for an appropriate period of time. You know, and if it's 10 minutes, it's 10 minutes. If it's 15, it's 15. If it's 20, it's 20. If it's an hour, it's an hour. But what's reasonable for me? That I'm going to not be too challenged, but push myself a little bit. And then at the end of the meditation practice, uh, this, this came from a Theravada monk I listened to not long ago. I liked what he said. And he says that what he does uh, to help him maintain a practice of meditation is at the end of the meditation, he takes a little time after he's done, before he gets up, to check in on his mental state, to see what the benefit was of my sit. How is my mind different than before I started? How does it feel that I accomplished what I said I would do? How do I feel here at the end? And just sit with that for a few. And, oh, I did that. You know, how's my mind? Is it better? Do I feel better? Even if I didn't, how do I feel that I did it? And he just sits with that before he gets up. So that's good advice. And, you know, if I wasn't so busy, I, I would try it. And uh, maybe, maybe I'll get around to it if I don't procrastinate. <clears throat> it sounds like good advice. <laughs> Humor is, is helpful in this thing called joyous effort. So this is, uh, I think, uh, if, if we really want to unpack uh, an effort that becomes right effort that's joyous and right effort would be the eightfold path joyous is the bodhisattva path is to really come from a place of understanding that this is an opportunity to transform my life eliminate suffering even if it hurts <laughs> and 
that my practice becomes this opportunity to bring to my mind effortfully, it takes effort to know that each of these events is an opportunity to improve my life. You're the cause for my awakening. The events are the cause for my awakening. They're the opportunities to see my afflictions and apply antidotes to cultivate wisdom and understand their independence. And that's going to require some effort to maintain that. So mental stability, training our mind with meditation is going to be key to be able to maintain and sustain an effort of noting, am I planting the seeds for my awakening or am I planting the seeds for my prison? <laughs> What am I doing? Harmlessness, harmfulness. Goodwill, ill will. Self-centered or interdependent. So meditation is key. And, uh, and having a meditation practice that we feel good about, that's sustainable. That even if I didn't meditate today, to have the thought that I still value it, it's important to me. And I'm going to give myself credit for wanting to meditate. Really wanted to meditate today. And it's meaningful. And maybe I'll do it a little later. As opposed to, I'm not enough, can't do it. There I am, one more time. See, I'm a failure. I can't get, you know. How many times do I need to start a practice? How about I never stopped? I just had some lulls in the action. <laughs> I never stopped. I always found this to be valuable, and sometimes I had some hindrances that were pretty strong, but I never stopped. There were just days I didn't look the way I would like it to be. That, I think, is the ground of cultivating a joyous life. And we're good enough. We're good in nature. We're all obscured. And, uh, and I have the opportunity right now to transform my mind. So I'm just going to pause there right now in case anyone has any questions, including those online. And then we'll unpack a little bit of the right effort. Okay, so <clears throat> in order to get to joyous effort, I think it's valuable to cover right effort. And so just a reminder in case uh, we weren't here or we forgot. This right effort uh, is the idea that I need to watch my mind and I need to be aware of harmful mental states that arise and then to alleviate them. So I notice when I'm dwelling on negativity around someone or something, I'm noticing those mental states. And then I cut through them. So I notice them and I get rid of them. And five hindrances, they arise and I apply antidotes. Uh, so that's quite a bit of effort <laughs> to notice during the day when I'm gossiping because <laughs> it just sounds like I'm having fun with somebody. <laughs> I go, oh, wait a minute, that's gossip. You know, it's probably not so healthy. And so to notice when um, these harmful mental states arise and to cut through them. And the other side of it is to... Uh, cultivate healthy mental states and sustain them. So there's an effort of being aware of unhealthy states, getting rid of them, cultivating healthy mental states and sustaining them. So a little bit of effort there. And again, meditation is going to help us bring that uh, mind so that we can be aware of either of those. 
And so that takes practice. And if we were to say, okay, I'm going to leave here in a Dharma talk and pretty much from this moment on, notice unhealthy mental states, cut through them, and cultivate healthy ones and sustain them. Uh, that might be a daunting challenge. But if I were to take a look at maybe a specific kind of unhealthy mental attitude that comes arises quite frequently in my mind, uh, well, maybe I could take a day or two and notice that and see how I can counteract it. Right. So all of us tend to have certain uh, mental states that are not very healthy that tend to arise a little more frequently than others. Some of us might be a little judgmental, you know, could be. Uh, some of us, uh, you know, procrastination might be one of those things that arises, or there's lots of things that uh, just, how about insecurity? You know, that could be one that arises. But something that we notice that uh, does not bring about, you know, a good result for us to, to be aware of. And, uh, and then work on that for a little while and see if you can counteract that. Likewise, we can pick a specific mental quality that we'd like to cultivate, sustain, and practice that. You know, patience is a good one. Well, if you're patient, how would you ever get angry if you were patient? Just saying, patience is a good one to practice. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, it's my go-to. Anything, it's patience. Uh, so here we start with this right effort, and then that can be transformed into joyous effort. That it actually feels good to cultivate and sustain healthy mental states. And it's as joyful to be able to, wow, here's a day that will never come again in this life in a rare and precious human rebirth with all 18 specific qualities to cultivate enlightenment. I have it right now in this lifetime. And right now the opportunity to cultivate my highest potentials. Who wouldn't want that? Well, that's actually true. <laughs> but again, how do we sustain that? And we sustain that with this understanding of our interconnection and uh, they have these uh, three types of, of joyous effort. Uh, but one of them I want to focus on is uh, a joy around constructive action. I think that's attainable. Easier than some of the more of a, a joy, you know, working to benefit all others. I mean, that seems, that could be a little far out, right? We need to work our way up to that, maybe. But I think it's doable to have a joy in construction action. In other words, no matter what's going on, no matter what my mind state is, no matter whether I'm frustrated or tired or whatnot, I think I can make an effort for constructive action in this moment. And that constructive action might be <laughs> just not saying something right now, right? That constructive action could be, you know, taking a walk around the building. <laughs> that constructive action uh, could be in this situation, what's the healthiest thing I could do right now? And, and that we can really celebrate that. And whatever the environment was going on, I took a constructive action. Because we can always find a constructive action. Even if I have an unconstructive action, my awareness of it could be a constructive action. <laughs> oh, I really screwed that up. <laughs> oh, constructive action. <laughs> I don't want to do that again. Constructive action. Apologize. Constructive action. So, Instead of having that mind that says everyone else is getting it, I'm not. This is too difficult and too challenging. 
I can't do it. You know, my little quote is, it's not time to give up, it's time to get up. Right? Whatever the event, just getting up is a constructive action. Getting up is always a constructive action. Didn't do my practice, didn't do this, whatever. Well, get up. Constructive action. And in that way, there's a sustainability that's always accessible. And it's through a consistent practice of continually getting up, understanding that I never stopped getting up. that I can recognize how good it feels to have an opportunity right now and to be able to cultivate that mind. So with, with right effort, it's saying that I am going to become aware of the ebbs and the flows. I'm going to, even when I'm in despair, cultivate a sense that this won't last and what's the healthiest thing for me to do now and i can start with the joyous effort of constructive action and then i get to feel good about that constructive action and just do that more just do that more One of the, just I think in general, when I talk to people, the biggest struggle is a sense that we're just not, like there's some far-flung thing. And, uh, and we don't recognize that we're already doing it. If you're sitting in this room, you're doing it. If uh, you're showing up for life in the face of adversity, you're doing it. And that we're already have the elements of Buddha nature. That's just obscured with a lot of previous conditioning. But right now I'm creating my conditioning for the future. Right now. What seeds am I planting? No matter what's happening, what seeds am I planting now? What I'm planting now is creating the rest of my path. And I always have the ability now to plant the seeds of awakening. Coming from renunciation, goodwill harmlessness and maybe even do it for the benefit of all sentient beings and I'm going to make good use of this opportunity even though it's challenging I'm ahead of schedule it's a rarity uh, <clears throat> so back into the context then of the bodhisattva path of these six perfections it's not linear. It's, you know, the more generous I am, the easier it is to be ethical because I'm not so stingy. <laughs> the more ethical I am, you know, the easier it is uh, to avoid a lot of negative mental states. And I'll have uh, more opportunity to be patient. The more patient I am, it's easier to be ethical and generous. They, they're all intertwined. The, the more joyous effort I have, you know, the easier it is then to have some patience with things and to be more ethical and so forth so they're intertwined and once again there's generosity ethics patience joyous effort concentration and wisdom so i'm a little congested today and so if i am engaging in this path then I think that effort, you know, it's interesting, it's the fourth one. But isn't it really the first one? Isn't it really the first one? And that's why I brought it to our starting point, that wherever we're at, when I first walked in that gym, or when I first walked into a Dharma Center, wherever we're at, all of the tools, resources are available to us. And all we have to do is use them. So all we have to do is use them. And it might be awkward at first. <laughs> it might seem overwhelming. It might seem uncomfortable. But as we do anything 
again and again. It becomes more second nature. We condition ourselves and, you know, the science behind that they do now with the neuroplasticity and how we uh, redesign ourselves and even how our genes express themselves. Well, that's just on a, you know, physiological layer that they're finding that I can turn my gene expression up and down. I'm not stuck in any way. If I just start doing things different, my body changes, my brain rewires, my whole systems change. And so that person I once was, you know, clearly is not who I am today, whoever you are. But instead of unconsciously changing <laughs> over 40 years, I can consciously be shaping my experience of planting the seeds of awakening. And so that's where right effort comes back into the seeds that I'm planting in this moment. And no matter what this moment is like, it's offering me the opportunity to cultivate the seeds of my future by being aware of my motivations and intentions. Healthy mental state, unhealthy mental state. Is this a constructive action or an unconstructive action? Is this me-centered or is it we-centered? Interdependent or not? So that effort then starts with some meditation so I can be present to examine those things. But to start small and understand this is a journey, I think of all things, that's probably been the most helpful for me. I don't do many things well, but one thing I'm pretty good at is, uh, is understand this is a long-term thing. So I, I'm not very self, I don't beat myself up a lot. And I think that's helped me a lot in terms of my practice, because it's far from perfect. But it's, I'm in a better place than I used to be. And so I think I, you know, really wanted to spend some time on that, understanding that the real source of our mental and emotional suffering is the way we're, uh, what we're bringing to the moments in our lives. So much of that is my own lack of self-worth or my own lack of uh, sense of my abilities. And then there's also a lot of confusion that if things were different, I would be happy. Right? If things were different, I would be happy. And, uh, and so shifting that to right now, I can create a cause for my happiness. No cause, no result. And then the other side of that, I'll just throw this out there. <laughs> Is what if I knew that the unpleasant experiences that are arising is a purification of my karma. In other words, I planted seeds, I had a pleasurable experience. Well, that's coming, that's the result. I've done some unhealthy things, had an unpleasant experience. This sucks. Good, it's gone. Instead of thinking it shouldn't have happened, good, it's gone. I just, that's not part of my experience anymore. So going back to right view, if I start to understand that these experiences I have that are painful, that are difficult, are gone. <laughs> that karma has ripened, it's gone. That's kind of liberating. Yeah, this sucks, but it's gone. And it's given me the opportunity to see that how I respond to that karma can allow me to create the seeds of karma that's going to cultivate a path of awakening. How do I respond to it? So right now I'm planting the seeds for the future. This happened, that's resulting karma, causal karma I'm creating. So that's, I think, the entry point to right effort and joyous effort is the, you know, the right effort's doing the right thing. The joyful part is to, <laughs> to recognize how good it is. Like, why wouldn't I be joyful in doing things that will eliminate suffering in my life and the lives of others? So that comes with a little time. 
what's the joke on that? They call it joy, joyful effort, but it feels a lot like perseverance. And then after a while, it becomes joyful because you reap the benefits. Because that works its way out over time. Anyone online with a question or thought? I'm practicing patience with my licorice and restraint. Okay. I don't think I want to go much further because once I tap into the other pieces, it's going to be a bigger thing. So what I'm going to encourage people to do then is uh, to this week, See if we can have an effort of noticing an unhealthy habit of mental thought that it kind of is not healthy that I, I don't want to uh, I'll notice when it arises and see if I can eliminate it and shift to a healthier mental state. So we're going to start at right view or right effort. And this week, just see if we can, you know, each day, what's a healthy mental state I would like to nurture and what's an unhealthy one I want to be aware of what's a habit you know is it judging others is it you know you know a lot of times a lot of self-talk's not good you ever notice that just negative self-talk or this is gonna be a long day oh my god just you know just complaining complaining could be a thing right which is different from constructive problem solving right there's constructive problem solving and there's complaining you know let me tell you how Horrible it was to stand in line for 30 minutes. If Sam's listening, that was a great example. Sam went and ordered tires and went and drove all the way. And he didn't complain at all. He was just, well, it just took time. I mean, this guy was joyous effort. He came down here yesterday and then had, you know, all that line. But no worries. He just went to the, his next thing. And, uh, so maybe there's a mental habit. What is it complaining? Is it, you know, I'll let you come up with your own. I don't want to plant those seeds. And and what that you'd like to just practice cultivate. And that that is really what this this uh, right effort is is the effort to continue to cultivate the healthier mental states and eliminate the unhealthy mental states. It's nice to start with just something I can zero in on. Like, what's a key thing I do a lot that's not very productive? And what's a thing I would like to do more? And then uh, those of you who make it back here next week or online, uh, let's check in on that. And then uh, next week, we'll, we'll bring in the factors of joyous effort, bodhisattva path. Uh, but also don't forget constructive action. Yeah, it's doable, right? Constructive action. Might feel good. Okay, last, last, uh, no comments. Sometimes people are trying to push the button on the, on the internet. Well, we'll dedicate them. <clears throat> Ah, so we've taken some time to be here with each other, cultivating our highest potentials and the path of awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. Honoring teachings have been passed down for thousands of years through all the efforts of so many kind and dedicated beings. Let's take a moment to dedicate these teachings, our time together, both individually and collectively, to dedicate the marriage and wisdom for the benefit of all sentient beings. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and find their awakening. May we be able to use the merit and wisdom accumulate here today and throughout our lifetimes to purify our own minds, to help us cultivate these six perfections so we can become awakened beings free of suffering for the benefit of all sentient beings. May we also dedicate the merit and wisdom accumulate here today and throughout our lives 
for the long life of all the spiritual teachers of all spiritual traditions that are authentically teaching a path of no more suffering. May they live long, may their teachings flourish, may their students benefit from them. All right, thank you all so much. Uh, good to have those of you physically present and those of you online uh, same time next week.